now I'm in Madrid for Orgullo 2021. And I want to talk about how Spain went from this to this. Tell this story, we have to go back. Well, I didn't expect a kind of Spanish Inquisition. <laughs> Nobody expects the Spanish Inquisition. No, not that far back. Right around here. But before we get started, consider subscribing and hitting the like button. July 18th, 1936. Civil war breaks out in Spain. Before this date, Spain had pretty much been in constant upheaval for centuries. After a few failed monarchies, Spain established the first Spanish Republic in 1873. Eleven months later, there was a coup, big surprise, and once again the monarchy took power. Spain was thrown into decades of instability and infighting until the founding of the Second Spanish Republic in 1931. This is where our story begins. The Second Republic, led by its first Prime Minister, Niceto Alcalá Zamora, took power in the midst of the Great Depression. Zamora tried to subdue the harsh effects of the Great Depression on farm workers by giving them more rights, like regulating salaries and establishing an eight-hour workday. These changes were meant to help out the poor, but instead only alienated the rich landowners who had to pay those workers. Paying workers adequately for their work. What a disgrace. When the Second Republic enforced the Spanish Constitution in 1931, church and state were separated for the first time in Spain. It gave women the right to vote, took nuns and monks out of schools, and legalized divorce. Obviously, the Catholic Church didn't like that. In 1933, Pope Pius XI called out Spain for anti-clericalism. This may have called conservatives to action because they went out and exercised their right to vote, and later that year, the right took more power in parliament. This upset the socialists and the working class people who were already upset with the lack of enforcement of the agrarian reforms from the Second Republic. So in October the next year, these socialists and frustrated workers launched the Asturian Miner Strike of 1934. What started as a strike soon evolved into an attempted revolutionary uprising in which the miners used a resource that miners tend to have a lot of. About 375 pounds of powder. Dynamite. Blasting time to take control of the region of Asturias. Okay, side note. You may have heard of a little thing called colonialism. The act of one country going to a foreign land, setting up camp, and basically killing almost everyone who was already there and sucking the land dry of its resources. Well, at one time, Spain was really, really good at this. The best in the world. However, through the centuries, Spain lost the majority of its colonies. But by the 20th century, they were still clinging on to their African colonies with all their might, specifically in Morocco. That's why in the early 20th century, the greatest force of Spain's army was the Army of Africa. Okay, so back to Asturias. Enter Francisco Franco. He is a small, plump man with a little mustache and fading hair. If it were not for the uniform, one would take him for a retired bookkeeper living on his savings. Yet Franco has dominated Spain for a quarter of a century. As a senior military general at the time, Franco brought in the Army of Africa to Asturias and quickly squashed the rebel uprising. Due to his success, Franco came to be known as a great military leader. But he was loyal to the monarchy, and the Republic knew that. So in 1936, he and other monarchy sympathizers were removed from their influential military positions. The leader of the African army, General Emilio Mola, was moved to the less developed region of Navarre. Inspector General Manuel Gode Llopis was sent to the Balearic Islands, and Franco was removed from office as Chief of Staff of the Army and sent to the Canary Islands. 
It was from these remote outposts that these generals, originally led by Mola, began planning a coup to take over Spain from the Republic. The fighting began in Morocco, where Franco quickly seized control of the African army and brought them to mainland Spain. In the north, Mola began his assault on the mainland, and Yopis came from the Mediterranean to conquer Barcelona. Two months after the start of the war, Spain's most famous poet at the time and known socialist, Federico Garcia Lorca, was shot and killed by fascist forces. Catherine Ryder of The New Yorker reports that one of his assassins said that he had, quote, fired two bullets into his ass for being a queer, end quote. After the Franco era, Lorca has come to be known as a Spanish LGBTQ hero. So the Spanish Civil War was between the Republicans and the Nationalists. While the Nationalists had the army, the Republicans had the support of the people. Civilians were given weapons, and the majority of Spain stayed loyal to the Republic. What was meant to be a swift military takeover turned into a three-year-long bloody war. After three weeks of fighting, Yopis was captured and executed in Barcelona. Ten months later, a plane carrying Emilia Mola crashed into the side of a mountain, killing Mola and leaving Franco to finish the fight. With the support of Portugal, Nazi Germany, and fascist Italy, Franco continued to seize territories, leaving a trail of bloodshed as he expanded on the mainland. Even though the Republic had received help from the Soviet Union, Franco's army had superior training. After the Nationalists took Barcelona in January of 1939, Republicans knew they had lost. On March 28, 1939, the Republicans surrendered Madrid, and the Franco era had begun. So the year is 1939, and Francisco Franco had taken control of Spain. The year 1939 might stand out to you because not even six months later, Franco's buddy, who helped him out in the war, Adolf Hitler, launched an attack on Poland and initiated World War II. So you might think Franco would opt to help out his buddies Hitler and Mussolini, who helped him out in the Spanish Civil War during World War II, but instead he opted for Spain to stay neutral. Franco did end up sending volunteer troops to fight with Germany, but only on the condition that they would fight against the Soviets, not the Allied forces. Spain had a lot of incentive to keep things amicable with the United States and Britain, because that's where Spain got its oil from. So Spain didn't exactly participate that much in World War II because they had a lot of their own problems but they were sympathetic with the Axis powers, and that was, like, not cool. That, that's not really cool, man. That's why after World War II, Spain was excluded from the founding of the United Nations and kept out of the Marshall Plan. The Marshall Plan, or European Recovery Program, was named after U.S. Secretary of State at the time, George C. Marshall. The plan gave over $13 billion to Western European countries in an effort to help rebuild the European economy after the devastation of the war. Spain's exclusion from the Marshall Plan and the United Nations only worsened Spain's existing economic problems. Okay, so you might be thinking, Ryan, you're talking about economics and World War II and the Spanish Civil War. I thought this video was about Madrid pride. And it still is. Hold on. Franco came into power as a military leader, and he assigned roles in his government to his cohorts other military leaders, and politicians. When Franco took power, he wanted to restore Spain to its glory days. And for him, that meant the empire in which the sun never set and the Catholic kings. He and his people truly believed they knew what was best for Spain, its people, and its economy. But the thing is, these people weren't economists. In an attempt to revive the empire, the state put sanctions on foreign trade and enacted ineffective labor laws. Their goal was to make Spain completely self-sufficient. Franco, who, again, was not an economist, even said, quote, Spain is a privileged country which can be completely self-reliant. We have everything necessary to live and our production is sufficiently abundant to ensure our subsistence. We have no need to import anything. Spanish isolationism and autarky led to over a decade of sustained economic depression in Spain. These years are known as Los Años de Hambre. The ruling party in which Franco was dictator, or Cadillo, was an authoritarian Catholic regime that was anti-democratic, anti-immigrant, 
anti-communist, and of course, anti-homosexual. In 1954, Spain revised the Vagrancy Act, which outlawed homosexuality and gave the police with the right to arrest gays and send them to galleries of deviants. This was on the basis that it was a security measure with the goal of correcting those fallen to the lowest levels of morality. This is a translation, but it's word for word. The law even specifically states that, quote, the homosexuals submitted to this security measure must be interned in special institutions and in all case with absolute separation from the rest. In theory, this law was created to punish homosexuals for their sexuality in the guise of protecting the public. But some historians suggest that, at least in southern Spain, local courts didn't actually crack down on LGBTQ people the way the act applied. As long as you fit into the idealistic mold of what a Spanish citizen should be, and you had money, the courts left you alone. This difference between the law and its actual implementation implies a rift that existed throughout the Franco regime. The rift between the ideals of the state and the ideals of the people. That's why LGBTQ havens like the towns of Torre Molinos and Sitges developed and even thrived during the Franco era. So a year before the Vagrancy Act was signed, after a decade of economic stagnation and people starving, Franco finally realized that autarky was not working for Spain. The Marshall Plan and the formation of the United Nations saw other European countries begin to prosper, while after World War II, Spain despaired. So Franco finally decided to look for foreign aid. And where did he look for help? The richest and most powerful nation in the world at the time, the United States. Spain needed the United States. And lucky for Franco, the US saw an opportunity to strengthen their defense against their greatest enemy at the time, the Soviets. When peace came, the Soviet Union emerged as the strongest nation in Europe. So the United States was like, all right, Spain, look, we'll overlook the fascism and we'll give you some money if you agree to be on our side against the Soviets. So in September 1953, Franco and American president at the time, Dwight D. Eisenhower, met in Madrid and signed the Pact of Madrid. The deal was the U.S. would give Spain more than a billion dollars in aid, and Spain would allow the U.S. to set up air and naval bases on Spanish territory. This gave the U.S. a strategic location to station troops if the USSR decided to encroach on Western Europe. The Pact of Madrid got the ball finally rolling in Spain. Soon, private American companies also saw a huge opportunity in Spain. As other European economies began to grow and attract American tourism, Europe is luring more and more holiday travelers across the sea from the United States and Canada. Spain and American businesses wanted a piece of that action. So, American Express set up an office in Madrid. The first Hilton Hotel in Europe opened in Madrid. Hollywood started shooting movies in Spain. Open the gates of God, Alfonso, and Pasta. Even though those same types of films were being censored there, grudgingly, Spain began to open up to foreign investment. Now remember, only two decades earlier, Franco's whole campaign was based on blaming the outside world for Spain's problems. It was the liberals bringing in ideas from the outside that caused Spain to have such problems. And now, those same outsiders were the ones saving Spain's economy. So throughout the 1950s, foreign investment in Spain slowly began to grow. In 1955, Spain was finally allowed into the United Nations. But this slow growth wasn't enough. Inflation, weakening of the Spanish peseta, and debt forced Franco to rethink his economic policy. Mi peseta, mi peseta, ¿qué le pasó a mi peseta? In 1957, he rearranged his cabinet and brought in fresh blood. He hired people who were actually trained in economics. These people were known as technocrats. A technocrat is an official who's appointed to a position based on their expertise. So it's like using the scientific method to solve social problems. These younger, more liberal ministers enacted plans that opened the Spanish economy to foreign investment. Only a few years later, Spain's economy exploded.
tourism skyrocketed and billions of dollars of foreign investment were pouring into Spain. And it wasn't just tourism. Spain became more industrialized and started exporting more goods. The free market was a thing now in Spain. This period of economic growth in Spain from 1959 to 1974 is known as the Spanish Miracle. So Spain finally decided to play ball with the rest of the world, and all this growth was happening in the 60s. But Franco still had another big problem to deal with, and that was that, according to the laws of succession, he was not a legitimate ruler. He was a usurper who came to power through force, not birthright and not elections, and he had no right to the Spanish throne. So if he was to truly restore Spain to its glory days, meaning restore the monarchy, he had to find an heir. Okay, so you remember this guy? That was King Alfonso XIII of the House of Bourbon. He was the last king before the Spanish Civil War. His son, Don Juan, and no, I know what you're thinking. What do you know of great love? Not the fictional character. Juan III, the Count of Barcelona. He was a strong proponent of constitutional monarchy. And that was exactly what Franco and his people fought against. So instead of offering the throne to Don Juan, Franco decided to instead skip a generation and offer it to his son, Juan Carlos I. So at the age of 10, Franco had Juan Carlos I brought from Rome, where his family was in exile, to Spain to continue his education. Under Franco's watchful eye, Juan Carlos I attended military schools and later university in Madrid, all the while having frequent contact with El Cadillo. This was to make sure he understood the plan Franco had mapped out for his succession. If all went according to plan, Juan Carlos I would follow in Franco's footsteps and solidify his legitimacy by continuing his reign. In 1969, Franco announced Juan Carlos I as his successor, and Juan Carlos became Prince of Spain. In Franco's mind, the crown had been restored, and he completed what he set out to do. That same year, while Spain was looking to a new era, a new era was beginning across the Atlantic Ocean. The riots that took place after the raiding of the Stonewall Inn in Greenwich Village of New York City prompted a wave of demonstrations and forming of new groups such as the Gay Liberation Front and the Gay Activist Alliance that sent the message that the gay community was tired of hiding. A year after the Stonewall incident, on the anniversary of the raid that opened discourses on the treatment of gays, the first ever gay pride marches in U.S. history took place in New York, L.A., and Chicago. The next year, it grew to incorporate London, Paris, and Berlin. In a short period of time, the gay rights movement had become global. From 1970 to 1975, the world changed rapidly. Gays were not only tolerated, but celebrated. <sighs> Meanwhile in Spain, Franco's regime still held on to their long-held beliefs. In 1970, Spain replaced the Vagrancy Act with the Law on Social Danger and Rehabilitation. This law made rehabilitation centers for homosexuals that would, quote, guarantee the social reform and rehabilitation of the dangerous subject through the most purified technique. Apparently, that means electroshock therapy. People were sent to these centers for up to five years. Even though much of the rest of the Western world, people were talking about gay rights, Spain was left out of the conversation because of strict censorship and persecution by the Franco regime. In the following years, Franco's health began to deteriorate. Then. In 1975, Españoles, Franco ha muerto. Almost 40 years of dictatorship had come to a close, and Spain's fate was left in the hands of Franco's preened and primed pawn, King Juan Carlos I. But when Juan Carlos I took the crown, he abandoned Franco's upbringing and he soon made reforms to Spain's government, converting it from an absolute monarchy to a constitutional monarchy, following in the footsteps of his father and abandoning Franco's plans for the nation. In 1978, King Juan Carlos I of Spain signed the Spanish Constitution of 1978, officially establishing Spain as a constitutional monarchy with a democratic parliament. In 1979, homosexuality was decriminalized, and as the democracy grew more stable, Spain became more and more accepting of the LGBTQ community. The years following Franco's death are characterized by an explosion of cultural movements such as the Destape and La Movida Madrileña. These movements represented years of pent-up frustration caused by repression. The Destape, which literally means uncovering, saw a boom in erotic cinema in Spain. 
La Movida Madrileña brought punk music and modern art to the forefront in Madrid. And this is where director Pedro Almodovar got his start, directing movies featuring queer and gender non-conforming people. Almodovar is one of my favorite directors, so definitely check him out. In 2001, Spain cleared the criminal records of those who were persecuted for their sexuality under Franco. In 2005, Spain legalized same-sex marriage. In 2007, Europride took place in Madrid with 2.5 million people. In 2017, Madrid hosted World Pride, the world's biggest LGBTQ celebration. And today, Spain is one of the most LGBTQ-friendly countries in the world. And Madrid is considered Europe's gay pride capital. Okay, that's done. This lamp is over here now. Whew, so that was definitely a case of me biting off more than I can chew and seeing if I could chew it. As someone who's not Spanish and not part of the LGBTQ community, I did my best to try to understand this topic and explain it accurately. Let me know how I did in the comments down below. And if you enjoyed this video, please hit the like button. It helps me make more of these. Consider subscribing and I'll see you in the next one. Until then, give travel. Bye guys.